Welcome to the Writing Gym Podcast. We're here to pump up your writing. And now your host, Andy Brixey, personal trainer at the Writing Gym. Hey there, writers and news daters. I'm really excited about today's episode. Not only will you get the inside scoop of what kind of support first-time authors can expect from their publishing houses, but you will also learn top tips about how to write agent-catching beginnings. These are all fabulous tips, but what I'm most excited about this episode is that Terry shares the importance of finding a supportive writing community, which is one of the pillars that the Writing Gym program is based upon. I know you're going to love this episode. Happy writing. And now I'd like to introduce our resident writing coach, the gal who helps you pump your writing into publishable shape in the Writing Gym. Welcome back to the Writing Gym podcast, Annalisa Parent. So nice to be with you again here, Andy. So I wanted to give you all a little bit of insider information about Annalisa, myself, and our guest today. The first time that Annalisa and Terry met, we all went out to dinner in New York City after a conference. Um, We will, of course, post a picture in the show notes for you guys to enjoy. Um, What was that place called that we went to? I actually don't remember it, but it was a little bit of a walk from the conference. It was. We had a nice long walk through uh, downtown (laughs) Manhattan. Yeah. And now I would love to introduce our fabulous guest, Terrence A. Harkin. Terrence A. Harkin earned a BA in English American Literature from Brown University while spending weekends touring New England with bands that opened for the Yardbirds, the Shirelles, the Critters, and Jimi Hendrix. In the USAF, despite editing and writing for two underground GI newspapers, he was asked to write the 1971 History of Detachment Three of the 601st Photo Flight. He won a CBS fellowship for his screenwriting while completing an MFA at the University of Southern California and went on to spend 25 years as a Hollywood cameraman. His credits include The Goodbye Girl, The Legend of Billie Jean, Designing Women, Seinfeld, Tracy Ullman, MASH, and From Here to Eternity. Working as a cameraman on MASH and the six-hour miniseries of From Here to Eternity had a powerful effect in both style and scope on the writing of Big Buddha, nominated for the 2017 Kirkus Prize in Literature, and its sequel, Year of the Rabbit. He is currently at work on a third volume, Tinseltown Two-Step. In these cynical times, the Big Buddha trilogy stands out as a wartime love story where healing and redemption are possible from the traumas of both love and war. Thank you so much for joining us today, Terry. Great to be here. Yeah, Um, tell us a little bit about why traditional publishing was important to you. Well, I, um, of a couple of my friends that have self-published, they they usually have a, a nonfiction book that's connected with something that they're also some, some kind of co- coaching or or uh, teaching that they do, and a parent it, it, it kind of partners up with that. And with literary fiction, I just um, I just felt I. Uh, I wanted some support of a, a, a you know, I wanted a, an established publisher with some experience to, to uh, kind of help me. Now, the other funny thing I picked up at a couple of writing conferences these days, until you're a, one of their star writers, you will do your own marketing to a large degree. And I dreaded that because it's such a different mindset from sitting at home focused on a computer screen writing and then trying to turn right around and, and become a door to door salesman to the world. But I've actually gotten to really enjoy that. And in the process, I actually reconnected with my old band from college that I used to play with for a year. We're, we've gotten all hooked up again. They've been very supportive. I've gotten back in touch with uh, a lot of old friends, that I, people from the air force 40 years ago that I've gotten back in touch with. So even just starting with my own, circle of friends and acquaintances that's been terrific and i've met through my travels um, some amazing new people like you and your and your crew uh it's uh, it's been a great adventure i just kind of look at every day as uh, something new is going to happen and my life sure is not dull 
that's really wonderful. And I'm glad that you brought that up, Terry, because it's another concern that a lot of authors come to me with is how much support is a publishing house going to give me? You know, and I'm very candid about the fact that publishing houses don't give a whole lot of support to first time authors. They do give some support. So talk to us a little bit about what your personal experience was with the support that you got from your publishing house. Well, with the original publisher, Silkworm, uh, in Chiang Mai, um, I think we were both kind of figuring it out together because they they do excellent nonfiction books. My library's full of their books on Southeast Asian art and culture and history. But I think with those kind of books, they already had a university distributor in the U.S. and I think they had kind of a a, a built-in market for if you're teaching a class in Asian studies or if you're a grad student, you're going to know to go to their go to their list. And for fiction, it was a new direction for them. So um, I think they've, they've kind of watched what I've been doing and, and uh, I've, uh, any chance they've given me to uh, like get interviewed with, a, there's a local magazine in Chiang Mai that's uh, terrific. And that was largely through, through the publisher being an old friend of the magazine publisher. Uh, we, we got that going. Uh, somehow it's popping into my head. I, there's a a writer about my age that's what wrote a wonderful book years ago about uh, army guys that ran the giant payroll computer in Bangkok during the Vietnam War, called Memoirs of a Bangkok Warrior, and uh, he's written fiction books since then. And I just remember something he he told me years back about in until uh, you've broken through, you sell one book at a time, and that's just giving me a good mindset that any, I mean, just any place I go, I've got a few business cards with me, and if I, if I find an Air Force veteran, or especially a old, um, Vietnam vintage military veterans, they've been very receptive and very supportive of the book from when it first came out. That's so awesome, Terry. I, I love hearing the success stories like that and you working your working your way up and doing so amazing um i have a question i know that you worked with annalisa um so tell us a little bit about that work and how it made a difference for you yeah that was important because um the first book was out and i thought i was going to go back to new york to this uh, writer's digest conference and and find an agent. And uh, the agents tended to be um, from a different generation. And uh, I started getting the sense that uh, I was still going to be on my own and, and, uh, and, and working with, with Silkworm in South, Southeast Asia as a home, as a home base. Um, I lost my thought. Sorry. <laughs> you were telling us about how. Um how the work you did with Annalisa helped you to move. Oh, forward. gee. Yes. Uh, so, so I've got the, the, um, the first books out and, um, I'm ready to start on the second, but, uh, it originally, they originally were one book. And the one thing I've learned through the years is, uh, there are no more 800 page first novels. That's just not going to happen. And, uh, what I, worked out was to the first book ends actually where the original screenplay that this is all based on ended so it was a good place to end and uh what i needed from annalisa was just a sense that uh, the opening of the next of the second book was working because uh, in a way it was a guy stuck in a hospital bed and people coming to visit him. In a way, it was a static scene. There was, there was no action, but uh, she was encouraging. And then uh, just some of my fellow writers in Chiang Mai have also told me there was just a lot, just between the people who are coming to visit, there was a lot of tension uh, between the, 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 basically the main character who had gotten, gotten uh, into a lot of trouble and some of the, some of the guys that were, uh, trying to supervise him, uh, giving him, giving him a hard time, and basically saying, "Once you get out of 
once you get out of sick bay, we're going to be grilling you, giving you a hard time, and there was um, enough drama in that that it's that it's working. So anyway, we just uh, having Annalisa look at the like the first ten pages and give me a sense that it was it was holding up, um, starting where I was starting, was very very valuable to me. Well, thank you for that, Terry. I really enjoyed working with you and I know we had some conversations about the right kind of agent for you and uh, we had a lot of fun. We went out for a celebratory dinner and uh, a lot of things happened. Um, yeah. So that was really good. So yeah, it's a great connection and we've stayed connected and you've been supportive. I mean, I just got a, a couple of emails in the last week from some of the students that work with you that have, have now read my book and really connected with it. So uh, it's, it's just amazing how uh, we can all support each other and, 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 and network and connect. And uh, I'm really enjoying that. Well, absolutely. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that because that's such an important part of the work that we do in the writing gym is the community that we've created. Um, and I don't know if you know this, Terry, but you know one of the things that we talked about, and um, I don't know if you've run into this ever, but there are writing communities out there uh, where there's a lot of backbiting and competition and it's not really supportive and we absolutely do not want that. What we yeah. want is a supportive community and we've really created that, you know. Uh, so these people, they don't even know you, but you're part of the writing gym and so they've... Yeah out to you they have bought your book I know they've given you reviews they've spread it out there and told everyone how amazing they think your book is I mean that's just phenomenal in a group of writers so I'm I'm super proud of them and I'm super proud of the work that you've done to get this you know, and that just reminds me that I've worked very hard to get this far that for uh, that this was originally um, a screenplay idea at USC 45 years ago and uh, and I just through the years we get convinced to put it aside that originally I had a um, really big Hollywood agent tell me that Vietnam was box office poison and then uh, I'm, I'm working 12 hours a day on a movie set but I'm, I'm noticing all these Academy Award winning films about Vietnam coming out over the next 10 years so I figured maybe uh, I've just got to follow my heart and follow you know my gut that uh, maybe uh, agents tend to be a little bit working on what sold last year and trying to duplicate somebody's success and, and, and sometimes don't have a, a vision of a new direction to go. So uh, that's been interesting. It's also, I've been working on this for so long that uh, it, at one point it was very surreal, a lot of flashbacks and I just thought it was unfilmable and I, I almost felt like there was a hook there, but this is a book that can never be made into a movie. And then as time has gone by and actually uh, television has changed because now the, the, the quality of Showtime and HBO and then BBC co-productions uh, just gives me a whole new outlook on, on long form drama it has really got a, a, a viable place to go. So I'm open to that. But meanwhile, the writing, it's something that, that, uh, even when I wasn't working on developing the Big Buddha screenplay into the Big Buddha novel, I was writing a lot of spec scripts and wrote poetry and, and was writing uh, constantly for all those many years. And, and, uh, and, and I can just look back and I can see where practice helps. <laughs> yeah, so tell us a little bit about, this is a question that I get asked all the time. We love to pull back the curtain and see the behind the scenes. Tell us about your writing process. Interesting question, because um, for one thing, I, I remember some of my hero writers that I read, you know, back in college would, be, you know, consistently had a pattern of getting up at six in the morning and Hemingway would write his so many words every day. And then he'd go out to his cafes and drink his aperitifs and whatever. And uh, I think it might've been the years playing in rock and roll bands. And then also a lot of years working on sitcoms, but I've become a night owl and I tend to be most productive from like 10 at night to two in the morning. And uh, I don't necessarily recommend that, but I have, from time to time, seeing something in the New Yorker about 
composers or other people in the arts that uh, are also night owls. So I think there is a there is a group of us that that it's you know for me it's when the phone stops ringing and there's and uh, kind of the you know these days it's the uh, emails stop coming in it just gets a little quieter ten o'clock at night and I can get focused and I tend to be easily distracted so uh, it's a good time for me. <laughs> The, the writing process, uh, in looking back, uh, I, I actually got a little funny note here about a possible blog. Uh, I've come to see the writer as a weaver, as an embroiderer, and as a rag picker. And the rag picker idea is a lot of my, right, a lot of my writing is um, war stories or other st stories I just hear from people that I. I kind of shaped to my own purpose. Uh, and then some of my own like story, little stories that might have happened in college, I can take that I, grain of an idea, take that, that rag and pick it up and weave it into uh, another time and another place. But the, the dynamics of human interaction still work. Mm -hmm. I do love, um, Terry, you mentioned how a bunch of people got stuck on the fact that, you know, they read Ernest Hemingway wrote a certain way. So they felt like they had to write that way, but you discovered that writing at night works better for you. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we talk about a lot um, <laughs> in the writing gym. And it's one thing that I make the authors do in like the first week of the program is sit down and find your productive time, you know, just because someone else gets up at 5 a.m. and works for five hours maybe that doesn't work for you. Maybe you do better if you're, you know, running on the treadmill and, you know, talking into your phone and writing that way. Maybe you do better if you, you know, send emails to yourself back and forth all day. Maybe that's your process. But I feel like in so many other ways, we've been told, you know, this is the correct way to write. This is how you're supposed to do it. You need to get up at this time and write for this amount of time. And it's, you know, this very formulaic thing when in reality, we're all so different, you know, what works for one person won't work for another and you need to find what works best for you. So it's exciting to hear that, you know, you found your groove. Well, yeah, you reminded me of something. I had a second career teaching English for about 10 years and some of the in-services were actually quite useful. Uh, we did, I, I was teaching some writing classes and there was just a lot of emphasis in California schools about teaching writing. So there were just some, things we were taught about teaching writing that I could apply to my own, to my own writing, which is just get something down on paper and then go back and you can trim it and shape it and inform it. And uh, the other thing, there was uh, a, a woman who came a couple of times, Rhea Wirtz, she was really a character, but she would talk about energy levels and just developing an awareness of your energy level. And, uh, I would teach that to the kids and their study skills, but it was also something I could apply to I me. And I think that's when I started becoming aware about, wait a second, um, it's 10 o'clock at night and I'm, I wake up, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go. Let's just honor that. Hmm. <laughs> so I have a couple questions left for you, Terry. Um, the first one, which I really want to get in for our listeners is when does the sequel come out? When does part two? It should be done this month in terms of, going off to Ohio University Press. And if that follows a normal six months of product, of, of, I guess, the magic they do there, of, <laughs> uh, they have a brilliant copy editor that finds stuff that I, I just can't believe that I, it slipped through my eyes and a few friends' eyes. But anyway, they've got some very talented people on staff. And anyway, it, I'm, I'm just figuring uh, next summer is going to be a realistic time to look All right. this coming out. And, Fantastic. Uh, we will definitely be posting about that in our Facebook group, Right to Publish. Okay. And um, I will put a link, of course, in the show notes to uh, Terry's website so that you guys can pick up his books. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so amazing to hear about your writing journey. And listeners, make sure and check out the show notes at www dot writing dash jim dot com slash race for links to purchase his book. Thank you so much for joining us, Terry. Thanks. It's great seeing both of you again. If you 
you like what you've heard and are interested to see if you're the right fit for the writing gym, here's what to do next. Head to www.datewiththemuse.com slash publish now and book an appointment to speak with our team. Here's how it works. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes and we'll get crystal clear on three things. The best way for you to publish, the best way to achieve your publishing dream, and the exact strategy you should be using to reach your publishing goals. Remember, publishing a book well doesn't happen on its own. You need expert guidance to make it happen. We've helped writers all over the world to finish, publish, and sell their novels well, all while sharing their unique story and making the world a better place along the way. To see if we can help you do the same, head to www dot date with the news dot com slash publish now. I'm Andy Brixey, personal trainer over in the writing gym, and we'll talk soon. Happy writing.